Hello Tube. Today I have the privilege of presenting to you a world class level lifter who is surprisingly almost entirely unknown on YouTube Fitness. And the reason for that lack of visibility is quite simple the guy is French. And for some reason, my country, France, manages the miracle of having a plethora of high level athletes, people who are very gifted and talented. And somehow we never manage to make them known on the international sphere. Their names go completely forgotten even when they break world records. And I am personally sick and tired of this bullshit. So what I want to do today is I want to give this person the visibility that they deserve. I plan on correcting this injustice because I believe that not only will he benefit, you will benefit as well because he has so much to teach people. So. In this new lifter profile, we are going to analyze the training and physique of a street lifting champion so aesthetic that he makes high level bodybuilders look small. And his name is Baki. But before we get into that, if you enjoyed this lifter profile series and want to see more episodes, please consider supporting the channel on Coffee. It's the first link in the description. A $3 a month pledge might not seem like much to you, but to me it makes a huge difference because if enough people do it, it gives me more time to work on these videos. All right, let's get started. So if you missed the previous installments of this lifter profile series, they're all in the description for you. But for those of you familiar, the format and the structure is always the same. We start by reviewing the training methods of the athlete we're studying, then we follow up on their lifting philosophy, and finally we finish with a physique critique. But since I know for a fact that the majority of you don't know who Baki is, I first need to introduce the guy. Baki is a 27 year old French athlete who has won the Calisthenics World Championship two times in 2021 and 2022. This is the street lifting equivalent of the world championship of powerlifting or weightlifting, effectively making him the strongest street lifter in the world. And in 2023, when he partook in that championship again, he got second place. And the only reason why he lost is because he got out squatted by someone. But based on calisthenics alone, he was still the strongest in the world. But that's not the reason why I made this video, because you know that this is a bodybuilding channel. When a guy catches my eye, it's usually because they have a tremendous physique. And Baki is no exception. If you look at the footage I'm going to plug in this video, you are going to be shocked because the guy looks like an absolute horse. He has one of the most developed and complete physique I've ever seen on social media. All of that without focusing on hypertrophy. And the training naturally is going to be mostly calisthenics and mostly street workouts and street lifting because this is what he does. Baki is a purebred strength athlete, meaning that his training is unsurprisingly very high specificity. He does the same lifts times and times again because he needs to keep a very high level of neurological adaptation and he needs to practice them to be able to raise his strength. And for those of you who don't know, modern street workout competitions are judged on four lifts. The first is the muscle up, then it's the pull up, then the dips, and finally the barbell back squat. I know it's a surprise, many of you didn't know that. Yes, if you want to win calisthenics competitions, you need to have strong legs, you need to train your lower body, you cannot skip it, and you'll see later why, because if you have a weak squat, you cannot win these championships, it's simply not possible. But still, three out of the four lifts are upper body lifts. And as a result, this sport is the exact opposite of powerlifting, which is lower body focused because squat and deadlift are for the lower body. And people who think that deadlift is equally upper body and lower body will have a big surprise when they look at their physique down the line because it's not. It's a knee flexion extension for the quads, the glutes, and it's a hip hinge with the deadlift. So overall, 
a good 70 to 80% of all of your training volume is going to be for the lower body. And unsurprisingly, it produces physiques that, in my opinion, are simply not aesthetic because they're way too bottom heavy. If there is a king of performance sport for aesthetics and hypertrophy, I would say it's calisthenics. And if you look at the footage of the World Championship, for example, you're going to see that for yourself because you see a bunch of dudes who look absolutely incredible. And as an hypertrophy enthusiast, that is extremely important because it's a clue. To me, if a sport manages to produce a few freaks who look good, that's just happenstance and it means nothing. But if you see a number of individuals who end up looking great, doing something that is not focused on looking great, then this is the indication that there is something they're doing in their training that must be copied. So let's look at how a typical day of training goes for a champion of street workouts. And I selected three random days from back his training, all that I find are very interesting because they all showcase different qualities. The day one is a back day. It would be a bro day that any bodybuilder could do in reality. And he starts with some pull-ups. Now, the first thing I want you to pay attention to is his warm-ups. His warm-ups are extremely controlled. And he even adds a pose at the top. That is a specific variation of pull-ups. Once the warm-up are done, he is going to do one top set of two repetitions, not one rep max, with 80 kilograms added, again, with a pose. And you'll notice that the quality of the rep is the exact same during the warm-up as doing the top set. He doesn't modify his form to lift more, it's still the same technique. Once that top set is done, he's going to take two back off sets of three repetitions each with 60 kilograms always posed. And it is important to see here that the lift he selected, the pull-up, is in part, and in part, in majority responsible for why this guy's back is so out of this world. The pull-up is being oftentimes misrepresented as a lift that is bad for hypertrophy, and as someone who is an hypertrophy purist and who loves to shit on movements that are bad for hypertrophy, I can only disagree. It's an amazing movement, especially if you do it properly. So that is what opens this back day, and it's already a tremendous start. Then, Baki does some supinated Yates rows three sets of 10 repetitions with 100 kilograms. The first thing I see, and that just jumps to my eyes, look at his form. Look at this controlled, crisp negatives. Look at the fact that his posterior chain is not moving at all. This is actually someone who is doing rows and his upper body is doing most, if not all, of the work. That is crazy impressive. Again, it explains why his back is so developed. And then, to wrap up that day, he's going to do some ab isolation. And that, to me, is also the sign of someone who, of course, I'm going to want to promote, because we're not talking about a dude who is just going to hammer compound movements. He clearly has a great understanding of the weak links that need to be targeted. And hab wheels, for anyone who has ever done them, can be extremely challenging, especially if you do them the way he does them, with extended legs and with a slow tempo. Three sets of 10 at his body weight, you'll see there that the guy is extremely heavy, is super impressive. So looking at this day already, you can sort of get the sense of why I wanted to talk about the guy. But I want to look at these exercises from the eyes of a bodybuilder, from an hypertrophy standpoint. So the pros I have for this day is that Despite being a back day, which would be found in any bro split, there's no excessive volume. He doesn't do 10 sets of pull-ups followed by 10 sets of rows. He does the bare effective minimum, and that is usually what is going to get you the most results. Because junk volume is going to wait on you, it's going to take time, it's going to fatigue you for nothing. Here, he gets his outsets in and then he leaves. That is excellent. There's also, naturally, as a direct consequence, a good focus on high intensity art sets. And that is a strength athlete forte. Be it powerlifters, being strongmen, being calisthenic athletes, the one thing that you know these guys are going to give you is intensity. They're never going to send back their shit. If you tell them, hey, do this, they will do their maximum every single time unless you tell them to keep reps in reserves. The same is not true for bodybuilders. And that is something that must be learned. Effort is a skill. I too often times see people who train for aesthetics who don't know how to push themselves because they're big babies in the gym. So in a sense, having that strength base would have high carryovers for bodybuilding because it teaches you that. But at the same time, even though he's a brute on these movements, his technique is also super clean, also super crisp. 
it would make some bodybuilders blush. He doesn't cheat, he doesn't modify his form to get the weight up, he is always in control. His muscles do 100% of the work, as demonstrated by his beautiful rows. And he trains abs. He trains abs, a strength athlete who isolates his abs. And you know what? I'm starting to see it more and more. Recently, I stumbled upon uh, a powerlifting channel by the name of Sheathal Training that the guy who runs it's name is Sam. Great dude, great teacher. And I saw that he put high priority on isolating abs for him, for his sport, for the ability to lift more weights on the squats and deadlifts. As a bodybuilder, it's to look tremendous. But at the end of the day, I don't really care who tells you to isolate your abs. If it ends up leaving an impression and you do it, then it's a win in my book. Then the cons for that day is the fact that there is no direct isolation for small muscles of the arm. So you see that there is no bicep isolation, there's no real forearm isolation because he doesn't give a fuck about that. But if you are to copy his method, that's something that I don't want you copying, even though pull-ups and supinated rows will give you stimulus in the area. Don't get me wrong, but it's not enough. You cannot keep your isolation. Then there is also low exercise selection, which is normal for an athlete. And it's a back day. And as you know, I don't quite like that type of uh, split because there's no synchronicity, because it simply ends up being too much volume. But in this case, he does one horizontal and one vertical pull. And that is really as effective as it gets if this is your preferred method of training. So that's day one. Let's look at day two where he trains legs. It's a push legs day. He starts with dips. And you'll notice that the same logic applies for these warm-ups. The negatives are extremely controlled and the positives are explosive, just like with the pull-ups. And for dips, this is extremely important. I'll explain to you later why. But looking at the way he approaches it, it's the same. He does one top set of two repetition with 120 kilos, and that is that. He doesn't do more than this for this exercise. It might look like he's disrespecting the weight because he is. If you look at the negative and the slowness of that negative on the top set, you'd think, well, there's no way that this is his maximum effort, and you would be right. He can dip much more than this. But again, this is the start of a strength block. What I want to focus on instead is the technique. Look at what he does at the start of the rep. He squeezes his triceps together. That is, that is extremely important because it keeps your form compact. A dip is a movement that if you get out of groove, you're going to lose 30% of your rep and your performance. So it's great to have this very tight setup, to have this very slow and controlled negative, and then to explode. We saw the exact same thing with another champion street workout lifter, Shirokov. I also made a profile about him, you can find it in the description. And we also found the same range of motion. Humerus parallel with the floor. It made me laugh because Shirokov can do dips with like 300 pounds easy and I had dudes in the comments saying, oh, it's, it's a partial, it's ego lifting, he's not doing all the way down. Motherfucker, he wins gold medals. What do you win? Except the scorn and lack of appreciation of your parents. This is the way you're supposed to do dips. If you want to go deeper as a bodybuilder, you absolutely can. But this range of motion is absolutely fine. So that is the opening movement for the upper body. And that is not much volume, but you'll see later why. Then he does squats and he does low bar. Unsurprisingly, his goal is performance. Most people are stronger on low bar. My high bar to low bar is 20% give or take. One top set of four plates for six, very easy work for Baki. That is again the first week of the block. I have seen him do squats with five plates, more than five plates easily. Then there is bench, and this is interesting. Dips and bench. Why would you do bench? You are a street workout practitioner. It's not in line of specificity with what you do. You don't compete on the movement. Correct, but it might be just to feed the dips. It's always good to have multiple weapons and tools in your bag. Same for bodybuilders. I don't think it's a good idea, unless you're a complete novice, to only do one type of horizontal press. If you do only bench press with a bar, for example, you'll run into issues. It would be great to do also bench with dumbbells. If you're a dip lover, good for you, but maybe doing some ring push-ups, maybe doing some weighted push-ups, maybe doing some bench would also be beneficial because it reduces the risk of overuse injuries. So with bench press, he does three top sets of five with 120 kilos, so 275 for those of you who don't use kilograms. And again, that is easy peasy for him. He does them with a slow tempo. These are tempo reps. 
And that is also extremely close to what you would do for hypertrophy's sake. This is what a bodybuilder could be found doing. Maybe with something like a 3 to 5 instead of a 3 by 5, but still excellent work. So from an hypertrophy standpoint, the pros I have for this day is, one, the good exercise variety for push, which is something I just explained to you that you should also do if you're late novice intermediate. The clean standardized technique that is found on the dip, on the bench, on the squat, on everything that he does that all bodybuilders need to learn from because this is how you're supposed to lift for hypertrophy and the high adaptability. The reason why I say this is because you're not private to it because I'm removing the sound from the clips. But in this video, back he hurt his hand. He had a, not a car accident, but like a scooter accident before the session. And so he had some nerve pain in his hand and forearm and that impacted his ability to do dips. Usually when this happens, you and I, we might get a little bit cranky and bratty and say, fuck that, I'm just going to push through or I'm just going to stop here. Those two reactions are childish and they are the reason why you don't progress. Instead, you want to be adaptable. How do you do that? By doing something else that won't hurt. In this case, it was the bench press. I know I'm, I might, it might sound like I'm making a big deal out of not much, but this is the type of flexible mindset that is so needed if you want to keep progressing. And it's especially impressive for someone like Baki, who is a two times champion, who is still able to keep a clear and a humble head. Then for the cons of that day, low bar, low bar squat, but it's needed here as I explained, no tricep and shoulder isolation. Yeah, it's unfair. Baki has triceps like croissants and he has shoulders like the moon, even though he never does lateral raises, never does French presses, never does push downs. Or if he does, it's again, once in a blue moon. Why? Well, because we're talking about a freak. We're talking about someone who is incredibly gifted here. It might not work for you. But what I appreciate about someone like Baki is that he, I think, understands that he's a super saiyan because I've never heard him say to people, oh, just do compounds, bro. Whereas I see a shit ton of just mediocre powerlifters or mediocre strength athletes whose physiques are just mid and garbage who use themselves as proof that you don't need isolation when in reality it's the exact opposite. These guys are poster boys for the spider physique. They don't realize that they should be inspirations for why people should take isolation seriously. So in a perfect world, a perfect bodybuilding program, you would use the same approach that Baki uses for his presses, and then you would complement that with some isolation work. And that leads us to day three. Notice that on most of his days, Baki never does those one rep maxes. He reserves that for, for very specific occasions and for the days of competition. And I think that this actually participates greatly in him having such a good physique because his volume is much higher than the average strength athlete or rather the type of strength athlete that would be way too obsessed with the one rep max not understanding that they're testing their strength too much and not and not building it but if you look at the rest of that day the rest of that calm day he also does accessories and these are quite rare accessories i never see people do the first is a kozak squat Usually you see people do that when they want to stretch, Baki does it with a barbell with weight on his back. And that focuses on mobility, it focuses on growing health, that can become a problem if you squat heavy and deadlift heavy all the time. And it also includes a multi-directional joint pattern that is often ignored by most people. Functional training is spoken about a lot. One aspect of functional training that I apply in my training myself and that I agree with is the fact that if a joint can move a certain way, if it's applicable for your pursuit, like hypertrophy in my case, you really want to be able to move that joint in that way, to train it, to habituate it, to not be the guy who slips on the ice and tears both fucking quads, like I've seen some pro bodybuilders do, where I personally have fallen on the ice a million times, the worst thing I ever got was a bruise on my butt cheeks. Because even though I train for hypertrophy, I also try to make sure that I get my body moving in all sorts of different ways. You also see Baki doing split squats. Split squats are a great movement for size, but also for unilateral movement work. And it's, in my opinion, much more efficient than all of the shrimp and pistol squats in the wood when it comes to building some serious mass, which is why I personally think that the perfection of a performance-based hypertrophy program would be upper body calisthenics and lower body free weights. 
that is something that I even apply to my own training. You also see some Zotra good mornings from someone who does calisthenics. That is quite a surprise because they have the reputation of never training their posterior chain. But if you look at back his ass and his arm strings, you know that this is someone who doesn't fuck around with his hip hinges. He does them all the time. As a result, his erectors are crazy developed. And that to me completes his back because a back with only lats is not that impressive. You're going to lack that thickness, that thickness added by the traps and the erectors. And he has that in spades. So I also wanted to include that to show that yes, indeed, it is possible in this case to be a beast at calisthenics and also have legs that go with it. But it's not the only reason why I wanted to share Baki's accessory selection. It's also because based on it alone, you can tell that we're not dealing here with a genetic freak who got to where he is simply by virtue of his DNA. This is someone who is a champion of hard work, someone who is highly intelligent and who is a student of the game because he clearly has a keen understanding of exercise selection and programming. Proof of the matter is, I don't have much to criticize. And you know how much I like to criticize people, especially strength athletes. Some of these days, I could take them as is, make a few modifications, and they would be bodybuilding days. That is how good this program is. So this is why for part two, we're going to move on to the philosophy, the training and lifting philosophy of Baki. I want to put the spotlight on the mind of this gifted athlete, because this is someone that we can learn from, not just in the gym, but also outside of the gym. You know, I talk a lot about being an educated barbarian, and to me, Baki is a good example of that. He is a modern day samurai. He is someone who is invested in one path, and that path to him is street lifting. He, he wakes up street lifting, he eats street lifting, he sleeps street lifting, he's invested body and soul into that practice. And the philosophy that results from this dedication is extremely interesting. In French, he calls it cultiver la force, to cultivate strength. And you're very lucky to have me as your host today because Unfortunately for you, Baki only speaks French on his channel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that philosophy and I'm going to summarize it as much as possible. But to be able to convey to you where this philosophy of cultivating strength comes from, we first have to talk about where it originates and it originates in the body. Baki is an addict. He is an aficionado of physical strength. And I didn't insist too much on it during the training review, but the weights that the guy uses are outside of this wood. In competition, right? We're not talking about a gym lift here. In competition, his best dip is 170 kilograms. That is 375 pounds added to his body weight of already 200 pounds plus. For reference, this is an eight plates dips. This is you with a weight belt adding eight 45 pound plate to your body and doing dips with it. Outside of the strength this requires. I think that the hardest part about that lift might actually be to set it up properly because it, it's such a fucking bitch. Can you imagine having all of that weight dangling in between your legs? Actually, for an anecdote, if Baki doesn't have access to calibrated plates, those red plates that are 25 kilograms, he pretty much cannot set up because the big 45 pound plates take way too much space in between his legs. And I understand that some of you guys might not train weighted dips or you just look at it from a distance and you don't know much about the strength standards. So for comparison, to make you understand what we're talking about here, I myself, I'm currently doing my sets of weighted dips for five repetition with 135 pounds. So that's three additional plates added to my body weight. And I've been training dips for like give or take a year, which according to strength standards places me as an early intermediate, again, for my body weight. Baki is around the exact same body weight and he does dips with almost three times the amount that I use, which according to most websites places him beyond elite. There's not even a category for the guy. He is so strong that he exists outside of the realm of what is already known for human beings. Because get this, to be categorized as elite, at 200 pounds plus, you only need 280 pounds dips. So it's six additional plates. He slaps two more plates on top of that. 
And that's just the dips. Wait until you hear about the pull-ups. So most people would say that maybe a three plate pull-up is starting to become quite decent, especially if you are heavy yourself. Baki, his best pull-up in competition is 107 kilos. It's more than his own body weight added onto it. So it's 235 fucking pounds. For reference, this is a five plates pull-ups, which is also far beyond elite. It's not even on the fucking chart. And as far as squat, Baki's one rep max is 250 kilograms or 550 pounds. And that is his weakest lift, even though this lift is still elite. But sadly, this is what has cost him the 2023 championship because squats actually matter a lot more than you would think in street lifting. You see, squats were only added recently because they wanted to balance out the competition. They wanted well-rounded athletes, not just upper body bros. So it was a good idea to do that. And at the end of the day, it also created much better physiques because the reason why Baki's legs are so huge is partly because he has to get them huge. He has to compete on the squat. But it also had an unfortunate side effect, which means that now, People who are built for the squat are greatly advantaged because that lift has the greatest incidence on your total since this is the lift you can lift the most at. It's sort of the same issue with powerlifting. The deadlift is super fucking important because it's the lift that most people can put 800, 900 pounds on and so it completely tilts the balance. So if you're a guy who's like a bench bro, you're never going to win because your total is always going to be completely mugged by other people. And the proof of this is that the current world record holder for highest street lifting total is Xavier Aubard, who has a 570 kilograms total. And in comparison, Baki has a total of 560 kilograms. And yet, if you compare these two guys' lifts, Baki is stronger on every single upper body lift, except, of course, for the squat. Xavier squats 275 kilograms, and this is the reason why he beat Baki at the last championships. And I find this a bit disheartening because street workout, street lifting should be about the upper body. So the fact that low body specialists and squat specialists even have an advantage here and end up winning all of these competitions to me shows that there is a problem. Even though I understand the logic behind adding the squat, I think they need to balance this shit better because it doesn't make, make much sense from my standpoint. But outside of the squat, I mean, Baki is unrivaled. The guy is in a universe of his own and it doesn't just apply to calisthenics. Just recently, because I think he found it fun, he specialized in the bench press. And within six weeks, the guy was already benching four plates, which shows, by the way, that strength is strength. If you build a massive dip, you're not going to bench 100 pounds on the bench press. You will be weaker naturally, but the muscle mass you'll have built also, of course, is going to have a carryover there, which reinforces the idea that I shared previously about having multiple pressing styles, because at the end of the day, progression on one is also going to be progression on another. If your goal is to bodybuild, that is even better because you don't even have to really care if one of the lift peaks. If they all peak very slowly at the same time and grow at the same time, then it's a win-win. But I also know that a lot of you guys will not be impressed by a, a four-plate bench because you've seen that before. So instead, how about this crazy video of Baki doing front level pull-ups, which by itself is already impressive, with a whole human being holding onto them. And the guy is not light. The guy was 180 pounds and he was easily able to do reps upon reps upon reps. In my view and in my word, this is easily top five craziest feats of strength I've ever seen. And yet the guy is almost completely unknown on this stupid platform. That is not normal. Why, why do we end up with so many mediocre calisthenic lifters who have shit physiques and shit performance, who because they make fucking tutorials for beginners end up becoming the authority figure when the fucking world champion is not even known, even though he does stuff like this on a daily basis. Recently, back he also diverted away from pure street workouts, doing more pure calisthenics, 
and he is a complete freak on handstand push-ups. A lift that would already be super hard at 100 kg body weight, but no, not for Baki, that's not enough. The guy goes out of his way to slap on additional weight by biting into a rope tied to a kettlebell. And if you've ever attempted to do handstand push-ups, especially if you're heavy, you know how crazy this is. You know, it's something I said in my functional training video and it was poorly received by some people. I said that if you're light, like 150, 160, handstand push-ups are not that impressive because at the end of the day, you're just moving your body weight. But the more heavy you become, the more impressive it becomes. I speak from experience. When I was 160, I could bang out handstand push-ups, no problem. I didn't even train for them. You just have to get the balance aspect into control and then that's it. You can just do them. But now that I'm 220, I can, I can try to do a set push-up, I can try, but I guarantee you that I won't be able to because my shoulders will not be able to move that absolute mass that I built. Which also means that I have a lot of appreciation for guys who are very jacked and very heavy who are able to do it. And if you remember Erzoviak, who I also made a video about, another French lifter that is highly underrated, was able to do handstand push-ups with his body weight of 180 for sets of six. Baki is 40 pounds heavier and he does the exact same thing with additional weight. And it doesn't stop there. He's also a freak athlete. He has a crazy high vertical. He jumps super fast. He's super endurant. He's incredibly flexible. He's able to do a full split. And he's even strong on lifts he doesn't even train. Take, for example, his curls. He has a strict curl of 70 kilograms or 160 pounds. I know again that for some it might not sound like much because you've seen people do cheat curls with 135, but a strict curl and a cheat curl is completely different. I can easily do cheat curls with 150, 160, 180, but I sure as shit cannot do strict curl with 180. That would be impossible. He is close to that number, again, with minimal training. The deadlift, for example, some of you might say, well, how much he deadlift, bro? Most likely more than you, and without training it, he reps 550, easy with a hook grip. Who has ever heard about this? Have you ever heard about this? A calisthenic athlete who does hook grip on the deadlift and can lift close to six plates? Where is this guy coming from? Where is this planet? Is he a super saiyan? Is he the next arc of Dragon Ball Super that no one warned me about? That's what I find so crazy about the dude because nowadays it's become trendy to throw the word hybrid athlete around. And oftentimes when I look at the people who are calling themselves that, it's always the same type of dude. It's always some guy who runs a 10 minute mile and who can squat four plates. And that to me is not impressive and it's not being an hybrid. You're just someone who is doing two things at the same time and you're bad at both. You're mediocre at two things. Everyone can do that. On the other hand, being excellent at pretty much everything that you do, now that's impressive. Now that's being an hybrid athlete and that's exactly what Baki is. He is an absolute beast at absolutely everything. And funnily enough, if you have paid attention, you have noticed that yes, his name should ring a bell, Baki. Why did he name himself that? Well, why do you think? It's because he was inspired by the show Grappler Baki. He is a Grappler Baki fanboy. Once again, proving that the biggest and strongest in the natural community always end up people who have watched anime growing up. Watching Dragon Ball Z or Baki as you grow up as a young man is a boost. It's going to guarantee that you are going to spend the rest of your life trying to become a jacked beast. And so unsurprisingly, when Baki got started, he trained in a fashion that can only be described as unhinged. He would take a backpack, he would fill it with weights and dumbbells, and he would go on a 30 minute hike to be able to go to a calisthenic park that was far away from his house. That's already a workout in and of itself. Then he would spend hours at that place doing pull-ups, push-ups, dips, abs, whatever he could, exactly in the same fashion as Baki in the Yasha Ape arc. When Baki is in the mountains and the forest and he trains by himself, Baki did the exact same thing, but in real life. And of course, it wasn't optimal. Of course, it wasn't the best use of his, of his time. But shit, look at what it built. Look at the foundations it laid and look at the magnificent building that he was able to build on top of these savage foundations. 
And Baki is not the only calisthenics guy that I've seen do this. It seems to be a pattern. It seems to be that this sport, this approach in particular, breeds that type of people, which is why I still believe and I still say to this day that calisthenics and street workout is the best performance-based sport to build an aesthetic body. If you want to be a beast and look good at the same time, this is what you should be doing. Not only because the lifts you'll be doing are going to be suited to an aesthetic body, but also because the practice in itself is perfect to build and to foster spiritual strength, to foster a mindset that is going to lead to excellence. And this is found and demonstrated in Baki's journey. Because despite being the world champion and being pretty much unmatched and unrivaled, the guy is still pushing. He's still looking at areas of the sport, areas of his own body that he can improve because he's on a crusade against weakness. That is what the philosophy of cultivating strength means. It's not just about the body. It's constantly pushing your own limit, constantly challenging yourself to keep growing as a man, which is admirable because most people at his level would either get complacent or just give up, just cash out on social media and say, fuck it, I'm already an authority. But not this guy. He is still to this day going. He still, he mugs you and I, okay? Completely, strength-wise and physique-wise. And yet, he's not taking days off. He's out there. When you're skipping, back he is walking. Next time you're getting lazy, think about that. Think about the fact that there is a dude out there who is a genetic freak, gifted, a monster, and yet he is putting in more effort than people who have garbage fucking genetics and who complain about it and who say, I don't understand, I'm small. Your genetics, you cannot control, but the ability to put in that hard work and to become a genius of hard work, that is a learned skill and it's a learned ability. And it's personally why I consume back his content. Even though I don't learn much from him and we do completely different things, I'm always inspired by his mind and by his just ability to constantly push forward, which is why it saddens me that he makes his videos in French, because truly he's limiting himself. I wish the English speaking audience could get access to his wisdom, which is why I'm making this video. So that was for the philosophy. And now we're going to end with the physique, the physique of a guy who looks better than me, 100% and looks better than 99% of natural bodybuilders. If the guy wanted to jump on stage in three weeks, he just needs to diet down and he would win. I would bet my ass he would win over people who train specifically for hypertrophy because he's simply just that good. He is an absolute unit. And looking at his body, again, outside of the stats that you have heard me share in this video, you could be thinking, oh, well, that's just like every other calisthenic athlete He's just a guy who's super lean and super light. And so like, it's a, it's a scam. It's a fraud. It's angle frauding. Wrong. Remember what I told you about his weight? The guy is my body weight. The guy is a hundred kilograms, a hundred kilograms. Do, do you, do you realize the amount of lean mass that the guy is carrying around? Because we might be the same body weight, but we're not the same body fat. I'm 17, 18% body fat right now. He might be at 12%. That is a massive difference at this weight. And he's not short either. You know, you can't blame it on him being a manlet. He's 5 feet 11. He's essentially my height and he has legs. So all of the arguments, all of the excuses that people like to produce to dismiss the physiques of street lifting guys, they're all vanishing in thin air because none of them applies. We're dealing with someone who has a complete physique, a beautiful physique, even though it's not even his main pursuit. And of course, as a last resort, as a desperate Hail Mary, you could say, well, clearly he's not natural. French people have done it already. N no one is better than French people at being mediocre and despising excellence. Don't worry about it. A large portion of the French lifting community already thinks that Baki is a fake natty. I personally don't live with the guy. It's impossible to tell, but my gut feeling tells me the guy is natty. And also I've been following him for a long ass time. I've seen his progression. I don't see no crazy ups and downs. I don't see crazy side effects or signs, telltale signs that he might be on the juice. This looks to me like someone who has primogenetics, who is a monster in the gym and who just loves to work hard. The result is someone you will never be able to catch up to. 
you can catch up to someone who is gifted and lazy. That you can catch up to. But someone who is a genius of hard work and a genetic freak, forget about it. The best thing you can do is look at them, rejoice that this creature exists in our world, and learn from what you can learn. So that's that for the Nelly or Not portion. At the end of the day, it's a waste of fucking time. If the people who care so much about other people's Nelly status spend that time trading instead, maybe they would have a good physique. So let's move on to the critique of Baki's body. Starting with the biceps, I'm going to give him an S. He has peaky biceps, better biceps than most natural bodybuilders. That's just, it's unjust, but it's the truth, even though he does mostly pull-ups and that's just literally from vertical pulls. You and I will probably never be able to get that result from that, but he does, so all the best for him for that. Triceps A, he has tremendous triceps from the dips, from the push-ups, from the bench press. The only thing that is lacking here is the long head. He doesn't have that like crazy sticking out long head that you get from direct isolation for years and years getting super strong. But still, his arm is a complete package. It looks amazing. And the forearms aren't lacking behind either. I would give a B for the forearms. It's still something that I think, especially the inner forearms, could greatly improve, but his brachioradialis is surprisingly developed for someone who doesn't isolate them. Shoulders, S. People say you can't have 3D delts. The guy has 3D delts and he doesn't even do lateral raises. He, he got these delts without vertical pressing. Literally, because he didn't used to do handstand push-ups. It was dips and it was bench press, and that is pretty much that. So I wonder how big his shoulders are going to get with... Vertical pressing added to the mix, it's going to be crazy. Chest, likewise, S or A in between. He has a slight lack of upper chest, but who gives a fuck? He has massive boobs. And that is dips. You know, people shit on dips also. It's, I think, really that there's an issue with bodybuilders hating on calisthenic movements. And I think it's because we're bad at them. We suck at them. And because we suck at them, we like to, dis to dismiss the accomplishments and the hypertrophy prowess of these movements. I say... Nonsense. These lifts are tremendous. There's a reason why I ditched bench press and I'm doing dips now. Upper back, S. Do I even need to talk about his upper back? He has a total shell of an upper back. It's incredibly complete. So I could cherry pick and say, well, the rhomboids or the terrace major. Nope. Everything is huge. Everything is jacked. It's just freaky. The lats are freaky S. He, this profile series always has people with tremendous backs. We had Alex Leonardis, we had Arzoviak. I think Baki has a better back than these two, which is insane to say, knowing the level that these two guys have. Then there is the quads, S tier. If I could steal any body part from Baki, it would be either his back or his legs. Have you seen his quads? Perfect sweep, enough definition to look freaky, but not too much. He is just... That these are just the perfect legs, in my opinion. Even the hammies are an A. They're not too big or like... But you still have this like curve, the roundness. The glutes are also big, but not too big. I would give it an A. Overall, incredible lower body. A lower body that would make a lot of powerlifters bru powerlifter brush, which is saying something. The neck is even big. I'm grasping at straws here, guys. I'm trying to give him bad grades, but even his neck is an A and he doesn't train it. He has the neck in line with the jaw, which is my personal guideline for aesthetics. Then you have his abs. I'm the CEO of abs and fuck that guy because his abs are better than mine. They look incredible. He has perfect insertions. They're perfectly aligned. There's nothing to say here. He has an S. So overall, if you look at all of these grades, this is literally the best physique I've ever graded and the guy is not even a bodybuilder. And it echoes with something I heard recently. I think it was Free Kid, my bro Free Kid, who said this. Who said that um, if tomorrow people who play football, basketball, rugby, soccer quit these sports and started doing powerlifting, all of the top powerlifters would get washed out within two years. He has a point. Understand that the true freaks of the sport don't go into bodybuilding, they don't go into powerlifting or calisthenics because there's, there's more money elsewhere. Here we have a guy who literally could be good at anything that he wants and he just so happens to pick street lifting. If tomorrow he turns around and he wants to do something instead like bodybuilding, he would fucking dominate. If you put Erzoviak and Baki on the same stage, bodybuilding stage, I don't know who wins. It would be a toss-up. That is how good this guy is. And this is why my dream, my dream, would be to make Baki focus on bodybuilding. I know it's not possible, it's a dream. And the reason why I say I know it's not possible is because I've listened to the guy speak. This is someone who is truly in love with strength. 
I shit on strength copers all the time because these are people who care deeply about aesthetics and looks, but who lie to themselves because they've never managed to build a good physique. So instead they do strength training. That's garbage, that's bullshit. Follow your dreams. Here is someone who truly deeps down love strength. You know why I know this? Because he could do anything else. Because he could win bodybuilding competitions and he simply sticks to what he truly enjoys, which is becoming a beast at everything that he touches. So if you're someone like him, who is in love with strength, I can only encourage you to go and follow him on social media. Yes, you might not understand everything, but I guarantee you that even without the language, you will get the passion. The passion that he communicates will get to you and you will learn a lot from his practices. You know, it's something that uh, I want to do with this channel. I want to give visibility to people who deserve it because they've worked hard and they can teach a ton to people. So if this video is the catalyst for Baki to make more YouTube videos and to make them in English, then I would be more than overjoyed. But that is going to conclude this video and this segment. As always, if you enjoyed this lifter profile series, click the first link in the description, donate or pledge, that is a big help for me. I'm going to see you very soon for a video that is in line with the concepts I spoke about today, about genetics, about dreams, about never giving up. So I'm going to see you again very soon. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.